Keep in mind that Dr. Martin Luther King, he was a reverend. He was a reverend. Many different forces were opposed and against Dr. King. Dr. King fought institutional racism. He fought individual racism. And he also had to fight against the war that was perpetrated against him by the United States government. One of the most vicious wars was fought against Dr. King by the United States government. So Dr. King wasn't some warm, fuzzy, wuzzy character. He was a revolutionary human and civil rights leader. So when we give honor and praise to Dr. King, we must put that in the right context. Moving along in our program, without any further ado, I give you next on the program, is a very well-known scholar in this country. She's head of the Duquesne University Small Business Programs. She's done a lot around town. She's known all over the country. She's a scholar. I give you Dr. Mary McKinney, who's director of Duquesne University's Small Business Programs. We're moving along. We're in higher gear. Dr. McKinney. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. This is always such a wonderful event for us to host here at St. Paul's, the uh, Mass of Peace and Justice, and uh, followed up by our celebration of Martin Luther King, his life and memory. Um, we recently changed some leadership in the Race and Reconciliation Dialogue group. Um, our former leader sort of stepped aside and said, we've done this now for 20 years. They're still very much with us. Cecile Springer is somewhere here. And uh, where's Cecile? Waving in the red. <laughs> One of the founders, along with Dorothy Miller, who was not able to join us today because of illness. Um, all I wanted to do was just say this welcome and just uh, read from here, actually, about the group. Because we believe it's a continuing, very important group. Um, as Father said, um, we want to embrace the Catholic doctrine that we're all created equal. And sometimes that, uh, you know, you look around and we still haven't achieved total equality. And that's what the Race and Reconciliation Dialogue Group is all about, to have programming and lectures and all, all sorts of activities to bring people together of all race, creeds, faiths. And uh, as we're saying, we're a faith-based organization. It was founded in 1998 to embrace the challenge of Pope John Paul II's call to spiritual revitalization and social justice. And we continue to do that work. And we are always looking for new members who can join the group and spread this message, not only here in Pittsburgh, but everywhere. So uh, welcome. And I'm going to turn the mic back over to our MC, Ron Saunders, who's been with the group many, many years. And we always look forward to this date because he has been our MC in the past several years and does a great job. And he will introduce our keynote speaker today. And then after that, we will do the awards to the essay and poster winners. Ron? Thank you. Wow. Our featured speaker for the day. Sister's been around for a long time, put a lot of service some time in. Valerie McDonald Roberts is Chief Urban Affairs Officer of the Bureau of Neighborhood Empowerment within the Office of Mayor William Peduto. In her capacity, she oversees cities' engagement of managers and staff in the areas of education, including early childhood education, equity, inclusion, diversity, Minority Women, Disadvantaged Business Inclusion, Neighborhood Revitalization, Immigrant Welcoming, Inclusion, Veterans, Disability, Community, Seniors, Women, Nonprofits, Faith-Based Organizations, 
and workforce development. She serves as chairman of the Board of Housing Authority of the City of Pittsburgh, convening board members and staff in decision making and operating a budget, 160 million serving over 20,000 low income residents, developing the largest sector of affordable housing in the city and implementing a wide range of self-sufficiency, workforce development, education, and home ownership program. She has served in an elected and appointed public office for over 29 years. As a Pittsburgh school board member president from 93 to 94, Pittsburgh City Council as the first African-American woman, let's give her a big round of applause, elected recorder of deeds as the first African-American elected to a county row office and manager of the county real estate department having managed 60 employees in office modernization and digital technology reform. Valerie McDonald Roberts has served on over 27 nonprofit boards and has received over 35 awards for public service. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in medical technology and Master of Science degree in forensic chemistry from the University of Pittsburgh. Both summa cum laude. Politically, she has served in the Democratic Party endeavors for many years on local, state, and national level including appointments to the federal, excuse me, to the Electoral College in 2008 for President Barack Obama, and in 1996 for President Bill Clinton, a delegate for Hillary Clinton in 2016. She has been a children's Christian educator for almost 40 years, a trustee at St. Paul Baptist Church, and married to the great brother Theodore Roberts, Jr., with four adult children, a daughter-in-law, a son-in-law, and 16 grandchildren. Without any further ado, I give you this pioneer, this pioneer, Valerie McDonald Roberts. Thank you. Thank you all very much. You have to read all that. Supposed to condense that, but thank you, thank you, Ron, and thank you, Judith, for reaching out to uh, my colleague Rick Williams that I work with. Uh, he is manager of diversity and inclusion in the mayor's office to get in touch with me, uh, and it, it's just an honor to have been asked. And thank you, Dr. Kenny, for co-sponsoring co this event and or co-chairing this event uh, with the award for the students, which is really what we're here for, is the students. Um, the theme is the struggle continues. Yes. <laughs> That's all I can say. The struggle continues. The struggle will continue to continue. And we just have to be prepared that as, 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 long, as, there's, uh, as long as there's a God and as long as there's a devil, there's going to be some drama in this world. And we are going to continue to see the type of um, racism, uh, disparity, uh, biases that go on. And we just have to be prepared to handle that and to not be able to solve everything at one time, but constantly move the needle. Everyone thought when President Barack Obama, that's the last person I'm calling president, I'm sorry for now, I'm sorry, but um, when he became president, everything became post-racial. No, come on. But we have had to deal with 19, I mean, 2018 has been one of the most difficult years that we have had, very difficult. We have had more incidents of just pervasive prevalence of, of, of racial profiling and just out and out discrimination. We have seen in rallies during 2016, people getting punched in the face people getting booed, people being called names. We have seen the worst of mankind in terms of where we are on the race scale that we've ever had, we've ever had. But I repeat, this is the worst we have seen. It's not that it hasn't been there. We've always had racism. 
And I dare say that it has gotten better through the years. Anyone that wants to, you know, play the game like, oh, it's all, it's been bad, it's just getting worse. No, it's not. No, it's not. Why don't you, I wish our ancestors could speak for us. And they can tell you about the good old days. And they will tell you that we have come a very, very long way. Let's not look at the glass as being half empty. That glass is half full, and that glass is getting better. Again, it's moving the needle. Every day, try to move the needle. What we have found is that we have seen more. With the prevalence of smartphones, cameras, a number of news media outlet, outlets that are via the uh, uh, via internet, not just your standard print and radio or television, we have had a number of media outlets through the internet, social media, where we blab all the time. Yeah, I use Twitter. I haven't been on it in a while, but I'm going to get back to it now that I'm retired. Uh, we have 24-7 news cycles, 24-7. You can turn on, I've never seen a 24-7 for CNN, and my husband turns it on all the time. I'm like, just do that story before, but it, it's, it's become quite, people love it. So we, it makes us, it makes the incidents that have happened, that have occurred over and over again in the past, it only makes them visible and it makes the argument not refutable. You can't argue what you see. You can't argue what you see. We have had, I would say, a debate on whether we trivialize or give names to certain individuals who have come to the fore in terms of what they've done, like Barbecue Becky. She was one of the first ones, Barbecue Becky. We have Pool Patrol, uh, uh, Paula. We have Permit Patty, Cornerstone Caroline, Golf, Golf Cart Gail, <coughs> ID Adams, Coupon Carl. We've had a number of names associated. Now, some people feel that these names trivialize that they downplay the venom that goes on with these people and what they have done, calling the police. Basically, totally humiliating innocent individuals. <clears throat> in, in fact, humiliating more than just that individual. Their families, their communities, just total humiliation, hatefulness, bias. But we give them these names? But the other argument is this. We're not making it light. We're giving it a point of reference. It's a point of reference. It's something that we can all talk about with a, with a feeling that we're not threatened, that we can openly talk about. Oftentimes, when you see comedians and they do the humor, they talk about racism, they talk about bias, they talk about misogyny, they talk about everything. But it's with humor and you listen to it. But it's the message you at least are listening to the message. So sometimes a little lightness brings people in. If you can't bring people to the table, you don't have a discussion. Sometimes you have to lighten just to get people to the table. So Barbecue Becky started the party back in April of 2018. Barbecue Becky became a reference point to discuss racism, to discuss bias, to discuss the police, to discuss a number of things. And of course, it really all, all started with Starbucks, okay? And somebody just happened to have a smartphone. Well, when we have the racial profiling, it's an interesting statistic. One uh, poll, it was the Huffington Post YouGov poll. In, 19, in 2018, 54% of African Americans that were polled felt that they were felt they were looked upon as suspicious simply by the nature of the color of their skin. Over half, over half, versus 6% of whites. We can talk about the ignorance, basically, of acknowledging privilege and prejudice. We can talk about that. Again, we can all rehash what we know. This is preaching to the choir. 
It's a lovely setting. It's a safe setting. I challenge you to put yourselves in not the most comfortable of settings. To put yourself where it's not maybe as safe, not necessarily in terms of the violence, but it's not safe in terms of your relationships, family, community, I dare say church folk, people that you know, other students, the colleagues, the friends. Oftentimes, we are in situations where we can't make a difference, but we're too scared. In my history, I would say, uh, to, I would say the, the hardest. There were many times that it was hard and I was kind of alone. And I realized that your strength, Valerie, God gives you strength in times where you are alone. You go back in the scriptures and you look at Moses. He didn't have an entourage. He didn't have a band coming behind him playing to motivate him. It was him and Aaron. They were all alone in front of one of the most powerful people in the land. And they weren't talking smack, but they were definitely challenging him. They were threatening the Pharaoh, threatening him. But God was with him. And as God is with you, we oftentimes forget about talking about God during MLK time. But if God is with you, or whoever you call God, whatever name you designate as the Almighty, if they're with you, you can't stand alone. There is your strength. You're just forgetting about it. You just have to do it. The hardest part is taking that step to do it. Think about the man. I think he had leprosy. And in the scriptures, Jesus said, get off your mat and walk. He was not healed until he walked. He did not get healed until he got off of that mat. He had to get off the mat. He had to take that first step. That's the hard part, is taking the step. I remember when there, in 1995 and 96, where there was just so much drama in my city council district with the police. And there were incidents that were just not, not right, not at all. And I decided that they were out of control. There needed to be some reformation. I interacted, people say, did you do that by yourself? Mm, not really. I had a lot of police that wanted me to do what I did. They were tired of the disparity. They were tired of doing their job and doing what's right and seeing others getting away with things, not doing their job, not doing right. They had biases. But because of that code blue silence, they couldn't say anything. After working with police officers very, um, I don't want to say intimately, but very, very face to face, that I had found out that their lives are in danger if they say too much. I had one officer said, Miss Valerie, when I make a call and I need backup, I want somebody to show up. Okay? That's exactly what I was told. I need somebody to show up. So I told them, let me fight the battle. You just have my back. Like, you know, I don't want to be tagged all the time for parking. I mean, you know, don't let them harass me. <laughs> I know what can be done, but just have my back. And that's exactly what I did. I went before council. I got no co-sponsors for legislation, seven pieces of non-binding legislation, not binding, non-binding uh, uh, re legislation that talked about ref reform within the police department that would have saved money as well. And I remember the day that I introduced it and uh, the day that it was talked about in standing committee, you could hear a pin drop. I have never heard council chambers. It was like crickets, you know? <laughs> wow. I said, you are alone, Valerie. <laughs> Way alone. But again, it's taking that first step. And through it all, I acquired six no, seven other co-sponsors in council. I had to talk to them. I had to bring them to the table. Just like I talked about, but you gotta bring people to the table and let them know where you're coming from. And believe it or not, they came through. And out of the seven pieces, six were passed. They absolutely mimicked what happened when the Department of Justice came in and forced a consent decree upon the city of Pittsburgh to reform the police department. I remember that scene. It was in the mayor's chambers 
Tom Murphy was the mayor, and you could not even get in those chambers. It was so packed. It was so packed with media, with people, because this was unbelievable, a consent decree from the Department of Justice. I couldn't get in there. And I'm like, oh, wow, all the stuff that they're talking about I already did on city council, non-binding. But again, God was with me, and he gave me a sense of feeling, you did it. Great job. You're not the star. It's the reform that's the star. That's the issue. And I just stood in the back and just felt good. Just felt very good. Actually, I wanted to cry. But it's standing alone. So the challenge to you, I will separate whites and blacks. To those who are white, I would just say take that first step. It is very, very uncomfortable to be um, eschewed, to be rebuffed by people that you know your family, your friends, your colleagues. It is not, a lot of blacks say, well, tell whites to stand up. <laughs> it's not that easy. When you have family, friends, and close people that you don't want to be not friends with, you want them to love you and like you, you've been with them for years and years, and all of a sudden you're standing up for something, you're like, what did you say? That is tough. That is very tough. I will acknowledge that. But it's a tough battle. Just move the needle a little bit. It may be at the water cooler, at work. It may be talking to just one person. Just one person like, you know, you should have said that. That's not really, that's not cool. It's just moving the needle. I would tell the politicians that are running for office, particularly the white politicians that, you know, go to the churches, they go to the black churches. You know what? No, go to the white churches. <laughs> go to the white churches and tell them how unbiased you are how they want racism to end. Do that. And then I would tell those candidates, gather good people just like you. If you feel awkward doing that, then have your entourage with you. That means many of you all, if you have a good candidate, go with them. <clears throat> Stand behind him or her and say, yeah, we agree with them. So you go to the white churches, particularly ones that are like, oh, I'm not that progressive, and say the same thing. At your dinner table, form groups. Do what is necessary to move the needle. You will not gather a lot of friends. That is the reality. You will not gather a lot of friends. You will find people that don't want to be bothered with you anymore. They're like, who is this? You'll find people that talk about you. What I've learned is I don't worry about people talking about me. Don't worry about what people think about you. What you do is you live so no one believes them. Just live so no one believes them. It's your deeds that speak for you. Now, for the blacks, keep your smartphones out. Okay, <laughs> have them ready, because you never know when you're going to need to videotape some mess that's, that's occurring. Keep them out and expose, not to humiliate, but to bring truth. Jesus Christ himself, believe me, there's a lot. He was crucified. You think a lot of you think everyone liked him? Okay, he was crucified. There was a reason. But he didn't care. He brought truth. He brought truth to light. And that's what you do. Bring truth to light. And you just have to keep it up. It's about moving the needle. Now I'll end with this, with a personal admission. I drive aggressively sometimes, okay, because I'm always late, okay? In my past, as a former uh, uh, official in government, I have probably a ton of things to do all at one time. And I'm racing from this to this to this to this to this with no time. So I, I drive pretty, I'd say with intent. I drive intentionally, how's that? I drive intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> it bothers me when people don't allow me to drive intentionally, like they're going slow, they don't know what they're doing, like, oh, I'll never make it. So, and it was worse when I was younger, because I'd use a horn and everything. It's just that side of me. I'm, you know, you got to have a balance, the yin-yang. So I, I'm very kind, I'm very giving. I, trust me, I will give my life for people 
But at least let me have that just moment in my car where I can be bad, I can curse and swear and say all manner of evil, and then get out my car and be nice again, you know? That's all I want. Just let me have something, okay? Let me have some sin. But I, but I, what I do is I keep my windows up. <laughs> no one hears me unless they're on the phone with me. They don't hear me. But it's bad. Oh, it's so bad. And I feel good actually saying it if it's a release. But the, the, the notion that I'm trying to express to you is this. My windows are up. I would never let people hear that. My windows are up. It's about civility. I have my windows up, and I will never, ever let people hear me like, look at that. Mm -mm. Because when I get out, I'm done. I'm back to being a Christian. I'm back to being a public official. I'm back to being civically engaged. I'm back to meeting people where they're at, no matter how badly they drove. I'm back to being that person. And I would say to everyone, sometimes you got to keep those windows up. In the past couple of years, those windows have been down. Down, down, down. And it's been awful. Keep your windows up. I'm not going to change who I am. I'm always going to be driving intentionally until I'm much older, and then maybe I'll let go a little bit. But again, no one's asking you to change everything. Just asking you, how do you deal with people? It's one thing to have a bias. But how do you act on that? We all have biases. Anyone that says I'm not biased is lying. It's deceiving themselves. We all have biases. But it's what do you do to act on that? What do you do to act on that? Do you have your windows down? Or are they up and courteous and diplomatic and civil? Okay? Keep your windows up. Keep those windows up. It's about civility. And when you get out, you meet people where they're at, and you keep that civility. Thank you all very much. God bless you all for the day. Let's give another great, great round of applause. And can we have uh, Mr. Robert Stan, Valerie's husband also? Okay, <laughs> Michelle, uh, another person I'd like to introduce you is a person who volunteered to work with us, and she's come all the way from Beaver County. Her name is Sister Michelle Peduto, and she's volunteered from she's at the Extra Mile program to work with us on our essay and poster contest for the coming year. Would you please stand, please? Okay, next. We want to make some acknowledgments. Yes. Uh, our committee, the co-chairs, Dr. Mary McKinney and Judith Saunders. Would you all stand? Judith Saunders. Linda McDougall. Cynthia, Cynthia, would you please stand? Cecile Springer, Eric Springer, Jerome, Dr. McKinney, Dr. McKinney, Jerome. Did I miss anyone? And Ed. Let's give it a big Ed. Jan Simmons. Jan Simmons. Okay, without any further ado, since I got that one wrong, without any further ado, I'm going to give you again Dr. Mary McKinney, who's going to give the presentations to our young students in the, from the third grade all the way up to the eighth grade for the essays and posters. She's director of Duquesne Small Business Program. I give you Mary, Dr. Mary McKinney. You're going to see what they either drew or you're going to hear them read their essay. So what we do is we have a certificate 
and a check. Poster winners are $50 for each student, and essay winners are $100. Wow. And we need to thank Father Stubna for supporting that program. So let's give Father Stubna a hand. Father's still here. So let's get started. Uh, I will call the poster winner up. We'd like the poster winner, well, also when the essay winners come. We're going to have you stand right here so you can get your photograph taken. And our third grader is going to be the first one to come up, Joanna Patel. That lectern doesn't have a very high ledge, so... And, oh, what the poster winner will do is walk around with their poster. Maybe you can even hold it up. Um, and then can you also take your certificate and your check? I'll read one certificate so everyone knows what they say. Certificate of Achievement awarded to, in this case it's Johanna Pickell. Um, every student's name will be here, a winner. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School, if it's a poster, it's going to say poster contest. If it's an essay, essay contest. Today's date sponsored by the Race and Reconciliation Dialogue Group. So here's your check and your certificate. And uh, why don't you go give your certificate to your parents and walk around and show everybody your essay. The next poster winner is our fourth grader, and that is Nablia Dinga. Nablia drew a big one that's got cardboard on the back and uh, all of that. So Nablia, here's your poster and your certificate check. Again, they can take the certificate to your parents and then walk around with your poster so everyone can see it. Now, what we're going to do is have our essay. Oh, the fifth grade poster winner was unable to come. His name is in the in the flyer, Peter Ducourette from East Catholic School. Grade six essay winner, Rocco Bisto from St. Maria Garetti. By the way, I neglected to say, well, it's on your program where, the, where every student is from. Rocco, are you going to stand here with the microphone? Do you have your poster, your, your essay with you? Okay, let's hear you read your essay. By the way, I just also wanted to say, this was very competitive. The committee really had a difficult time sorting through, and as in life, many, many things, with one main winner, but there were several very great entries. And thank you so much to the students and the schools who did that. Rocco, you're on. There he was, about to say his famous speech. He was very nervous, but he was able to go up and speak. He said, I have a dream. This is one of the biggest events in of American history. He said that one day he wanted to see his kids mixed in with white kids and, and them all being equal. He wanted everyone to know that not only whites, but every other race, too, was equal to one another. He wanted schools to have mixed kids. He didn't want to see any more blacks only or whites only. He wanted to see blacks and whites and all of the other races holding hands and playing with each other. But he wasn't going to do this violently. He was going to do this firmly. When African Americans were just children on the bus, if a white man came on and there were no other seats, he, he would tell the kid to get up so he could sit down. This went on until a lady by the name of Rosa Parks didn't get up. They ended up arresting her. Because of this, the, a boycott began. Because of all the black men and women not riding the bus, the bus company started to lose all their money. So they changed the world. All these things we learned so much in our school. Our school is pretty diverse. But about 40 years ago, everyone was Italian. I'm Italian and a lot of my family is. They were also made fun of because of the country they came from. Dr. King made sure that all racism was destroyed, but you can't do that. Racism is still around, and our generation needs, the one, needs to be the one to put it down. The acts of violence, like all the shootings and black people still getting pulled over for no reason. Once all racism is gone, everyone can be happy 
that there are equal with you and me. We will finally be able to work with each other, no matter the race, skin color, or where they are from. Like Dr. Martin Luther King said, we shouldn't judge by their people by their skin color, but by their character. Thank you. What do you think about that? Sixth grade. Yes. I mean, winner, Alexa Glinski, and uh, she's got her essay, she's going to read that first and then I'll give her her certificate and her check. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was very brave. He fought for an end to racism by doing peaceful protests. He didn't want anyone to get hurt, but he wanted to prove a point. He was born January 15, 1928, and he was an activist in the 1960s. He died on April 4th, 1968, from a gunshot wound. He was assassinated by someone that disagreed with him about racism. He died for what he believed in, and he loved what he did. Every protest was a life or death situation. He always had to watch his back. He knew his job was dangerous, but he felt that something had to be done. He wanted his kids to have a better childhood than him, with no racism. When he died, he left behind his wife and four kids. I think that the struggle continues means that racism and discrimination is still an ongoing thing, but it's not as bad as it used to be, thanks to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Some people still don't understand that we are all the same. It doesn't matter what skin color we have, the language we speak, or our religion. We all bleed the same, and we all matter equally. We shouldn't be judging each other based on those factors. He wrote the speech, I Have a Dream. It was about how he wanted racism racism to end, and equal rights for all people. When he was young, he wasn't allowed to drink from the same water fountain, go to the same bathroom, or eat near white kids. He was young, probably in his teens, when he wanted to change this. He was really mature at a young age because of everything that was happening around him. He realized that racism isn't right. I hope that racism can be completely gone someday. It hurts to know that others can judge people on what they will be like based on their skin color or how they dress. Racism isn't as bad as it, isn't as bad as it used to be before. And we can thank Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for that. By the way, the criteria uh, to, to, uh, that the judges used are the, the level of understanding of the theme that the student has, or really the issue at hand in society today, that was 50%, 30% content, and then 20%, we still like to see neatness and, and good grammar. So those are the criteria that, uh, that we use to judge. Okay, last but not least is our eighth grader, the oldest of the group. Marcus Jones, he's our winner, and he is from St. Maria Moretti. Throughout America's history, there has been plenty of events, rules, or specific people that have contradicted the Declaration of Independence that states, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The kind of people that are in this mindset only believe that one race is good enough for a certain thing. These people have never changed throughout history, no matter what facts are presented to them. Even, or, or even during present times, those people still act in racist manners. Racism still exists to this current day, and may even continue to flow through people's veins until a pure heart can cure them. To this day, we are still in the healing process, but it can't be completed with some of the viruses that lurk around every corner. The viruses continue to rip into that same wound and continue to make it worse. 
America will continue to be in this endless cycle unless we can bond together and eliminate the viruses as a whole. The one person that attempted this was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He recognized the virus and was one of the only ones to stand against it. He was courageous for what he did because that time was very dangerous for people like him. Even though he was in prison for his actions, that didn't stop him from fighting for what was right. He single-handedly brought many other people to fight against the corrupted laws. In the end, he did make a change. He got rid of those laws and gave future generations the life that he never got to experience. Dr. King has since passed away, so now we have to continue what he started. We must all be able to bond together and fight the virus that is racism. It's going to be long and it, it's going to be a long and difficult fight, but I do believe sometime in this country's lifetime, we all will live, live happy lives and won't have to worry about people's comments. Like, the, like most people in this country that are pure of heart, I hope that this dream becomes true very soon. It's sad to say, but it probably won't happen during my lifetime. So I hope, just like Dr. King, that my children live a better life without racism. Whether or not you believe it, but it affects all of us. Now, didn't those essays really reflect those criteria? I mean, we are so proud of these students. Let's give them all another round of applause. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to our MC. Okay, again, Valerie McDonald and all the essay and poster contest winners, please stand up and give them another big round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Moving along, I have a pretty good memory. And Nadine Powell, would you please stand up? Nadine Powell, I didn't acknowledge her. She's also part of our committee, Mrs. Nadine Powell. Let's give her a big hand. Okay, thank you. Moving along. Next on the program, as we bring it to a close, we bring it on down. Hopefully. You've been able to learn, you've been inspired, you've been uplifted with all the great speech from Mrs. Roberts, the students, the last essay, so penetrating and uplifting, speaking truth to power, complimenting Valerie's. So as we close this Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King program, hopefully you can take something with you Hopefully we have planted a seed that will cultivate, particularly in the young folks. You can grow and nurture and prosper, find your niche in life. Without any further ado, ladies traveled all the way from Gibsonia in an inclement weather. So she could close out this program with, we shall overcome. <laughs> Janice Seven. We'd like for us all to participate. So if you want to hold hands, and we're going to reenact and sing this glorious hymn and fight song and dream of Dr. King's, we shall overcome. We won't sing seven verses. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's focus on verse 1, and verse 3, and verse 5, and verse 7. Hold the hands in any way you can. I better have it here, right? We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We
a victory someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we run to victory someday. The truth will make us free. The truth will make us free. The truth will make us free. give him a big round of applause. We had some bad weather here. We had the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette here also. And also we have the NAACP president. I think he's here today. Mr. Richard Stewart. Is he still with us? Mr. Richard Stewart. Also we have a summit on racism next 25th and the 26th. We'd like to see all you folks come out to the summit on racism. Where's the location, Cynthia? Theological Seminary. Western Theological Seminary on Highland Avenue. We like. 